Good morning and welcome to Stony Creek United Methodist Church. For those of you who are joining us via our drive-in, could I please have a couple car honks so I know you can hear us? Awesome, thank you so much. And to those of you who are joining us uh, online via Facebook or YouTube or calling in on our phone, uh, welcome to you as well on the second Sunday after Christmas Day. And Happy New Year as we are now in 2021. Um, and the aliens didn't land, so here's to hoping that is a good sign going forward. A um, couple quick pieces of business. Um, Fonda, if you are around, um, I have a request for transfer of membership that I need to get into your hands, uh, but no rush. Um, if you are here today, please stop in after the service. If not, um, we'll we'll coordinate and get that into your hands. Um, do we have other announcements? I think just to hi, this is Barb McCarwich. Uh, I think let us just keep the Ellicott family in our prayers with the passing of Fred. Um, I think the family would appreciate any prayers we can send their way. And also, uh, if you haven't heard, Homer, Homer <coughs> excuse me, Turner is home from the hospital. He had an allergic reaction. And you know how we all enjoy the spa up at St. Joe. <coughs> so he's home now, uh, and he is recovering. So that's what I can think of. Awesome. All right, well, let us uh, turn our hearts and minds towards a time and an attitude of worship. Our call to worship, if you will read with me responsively. Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. In, In you, you we, we come, come home, home to, to rest, rest, to wrestle, to, to love, to, to be loved. loved. We, we dwell, dwell in, in you. Before the mountains were born, before you delivered the whole world, from everlasting past to everlasting future, you are God. In you, we, we are home. home. We, we dream, dream, we flourish, flourish we, we fade, we, we rejoice, rejoice, we dwell, dwell in you. you. In our opening hymn is Good Christian Friends Rejoice. <laughs> And let us read together our opening prayer. Loving God, you not only, not only welcome, welcome us, us, you receive, receive us into, into yourself. yourself. Give, Give us courage to be, to be so, so open, open to, to others, others, to let them become so dear to us that we might share not only your gospel, but also our lives through Christ, Christ who, who makes, makes room, room for, for us, us all. all. Amen. Amen. And now we get to sing, It Came Upon a Midnight Clear. You guys are in your cars. Just belt it out. Sing like you're in the shower. We want to hear your voices. <laughs>
join together with me in our prayer of illumination. Lord Jesus, your understanding of Scripture astonished and humbled all around you. Send your Spirit to illumine this word, that our understanding and wisdom may be increased. Amen. <coughs> Our first scripture reading comes from Leviticus, chapter 19, verses 9 through 18. When the, you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap to the very edges of your field, or gather the gleanings of your harvest. You shall not strip your vineyard bare, or gather the fallen grapes of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and the alien. I am the Lord your God. You shall not steal, you shall not, false, you shall not deal falsely, and you shall not lie to one another, and you shall not swear falsely by my name, profaning the name of your God, I am the Lord. You shall not defraud your neighbor, you shall not steal, and you shall not keep for yourself the wages of a laborer until morning. You shall not revile the deaf, or put a stumbling block before the blind. You shall fear your God. I am the Lord. You shall not render an unjust judgment. You shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great. With justice, you shall judge your neighbor. You shall not go around as a slanderer among the people. And you shall not profit by the blood of your neighbor. I am the Lord. You shall not hate in your heart any one of your kin. You shall reprove your neighbor, or you will incur guilt yourself. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against any of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Trusting in God's providence we share not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. God's tithes and our offerings will now be received.
if you would join me now in our doxology. Holy God, we offer these gifts to you. May your favor be upon them and prosper the labor of our hands, that your glorious power may be manifest to all. Through Christ our Lord and Savior. Amen. If you would please join me now in an attitude of prayer. Holy God, we come before you in a new year. And while we know that we're not exactly hitting the reset button, we also know that the year before us is unwritten. It is full of potential and possibility. And we know that you continue to walk alongside us every day in our journey of faith and of life. This morning we want to raise up to you all of the things in our lives that bring us joy as well as those that give us cause for pause or maybe causing us pain. We lift up those who are suffering today, whether physically, emotionally, or mentally, whether mourning for the loss of a loved one fighting an illness or injury, God, whatever may be holding them down today, we lift them to you and ask for your healing touch. We also want to give you thanks for all of the efforts and hard work of those in our healthcare field, our doctors and our nurses, our surgeons, our lab technicians, our research scientists, and so many others working so hard to help us to be healthy and to be healed. We thank you for their efforts and for their sacrifice of their time and their energy. Lord, we also want to lift up and give you thanks for those who work so hard to keep us safe in this world. We give you thanks for all of our servicemen and women serving in the military and the armed forces, for our police and firefighters, for our first responders and so many others. God, we ask that you would touch their hearts and minds, guide them in everything that they say and do. And for those who are far away from home, Lord, we pray that we may begin to see an end to conflict and that they may be able to return home soon to those who love and miss them so much. Lord, we also want to lift up this day our nation and every nation in this world. We want to lift up the leaders of our nations and ask that you would guide them in the work that they do touch their hearts and minds and inspire them to work together towards peace and the betterment for all humanity, not just a select few. God, we also ask that you would touch our hearts and minds this day. Help us to see one another as your beloved children, all equal and worthy of love and mercy and grace and being. Help us not to fall into the temptations and traps of further dividing ourselves in the ways that we believe we are different. Help us to instead see one another as what makes us the same, as your beloved children. We also pray that this new year 
might be better than the last. We pray that we might still be able to look back at the past year and see some silver linings, but also carry with us the remembrance of the many lives that were lost, the outrage, the anger, the hatred. Help us remember these things, not to carry them forward, but so that we can learn from our history, so that we can be better each and every day, not just for you, but for one another. All of these things, as well as those we keep quietly on our own hearts and minds, we lift to you this day in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And now, the confidence of children of God, let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our spirits are like new grass. At the dawn they spring up fresh, but by sunset they dry up and wither, blown away in spiritual death. Let us confess our frailty before our merciful God. If you'd please join me aloud in our prayer of confession. Lord, we confess. We do not live as those worthy to be entrusted with the good news of your grace. We relate to others callously, as though we do not trust that gospel ourselves. We seek to please and manipulate, using flattery to gain praise and distinction. We use condensation as a mask to cover insecurity or a need for power. Our motives are mixed, impure. Lord, reassure and cleanse us in Jesus' name. Amen. Please take a few moments now for silent prayer and confession. Beloved ones, believe again the gospel, that in Christ we are accepted as we are. Believe that we are forgiven, loved with the delight of a nursing mother cherishing her child. Believe that we are the church, the body of Christ, called to love one another as gentle children of God. Amen. And now let us join together as one in reciting the affirmation of faith, the Apostles' Creed, the ecumenical version. I believe, I believe in, in God, God, the Father, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe, I believe in, in Jesus Christ, Christ his only Son, Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our next scripture reading comes from Mark chapter 12, verses 28 through 34. The first commandment. 
One of the scribes came near and heard them disputing with one another, and seeing that, he answered them well. He asked him, Which commandment is the first of all? Jesus answered, The first is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Then the scribe said to him, You are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one, and besides him there is no other. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength and to love one's neighbor as oneself. This is much more important than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that, he answered wisely and said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. After that, no one dared to ask him any question. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to, to you, Lord, Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. And now let us sing Angels from the Realms of Glory. Third scripture reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 22, verses 34 through 40. This section is titled, The Greatest Commandment. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ you would please join me again in an attitude of prayer. God of love, we know that you walk with us throughout this journey. We also know that your capacity to love us far outweighs our capacity to love you or each other. But we also know that with you all things are possible and that through you, 
the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit, we can love far beyond what even we believe we are capable. And now may the words of my mouth and meditations of our hearts together in this place be pleasing in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, congratulations, everyone. Humanity, along with many other species, has survived the strange year of 2020. And we are now on the other side of some remarkably interesting history. I am hopeful that as time goes on, we will be able to look back at this last year and learn from it and maybe even find a few moments of joy and humor. But I don't wish to continue to dwell on the challenges and difficulties of the last 365 days or at least not as the primary focus for us for the next few weeks. Instead, I want to focus more on looking forward into this new year, a blank canvas full of potential and possibility. And while there is still a long road ahead for us in getting back to what we might consider normal life, I thought it might be good to engage in a long-time tradition or discussion around a long-time tradition to help put us on the path towards normalcy. So for these next four weeks, we are going to be following a new sermon series I wrote called New Year's Resolutions. At the beginning of a new year, people will often create their resolutions or plans and promises of what they will do new or different in the coming year. From eating healthier to trying a new hobby to quitting an unhealthy habit to travel more and beyond. But New Year's resolutions are not actually that new of a tradition or practice. In fact, research shows that the ancient Babylonians were likely the first or first known people to make New Year's resolutions some 4,000 years ago. They are also believed to have been the first to hold recorded celebrations in honor of the New Year. During a religious festival known as Akitu, the Babylonians would crown a new king or reaffirm their loyalty to the reigning king. They would also make promises to the gods to pay their debts and return any objects that they may have borrowed during the past year. In the opinions of many, these promises could be considered the forerunners of our New Year's resolutions. And it is thought that the belief was if the Babylonians kept their word, their pagan gods would then bestow favor on them for the coming year. However, if they failed to keep their promises, they would fall out of favor with their gods. And similar practices would carry all the way through history up until now. In 1740, our own Reverend John Wesley created the Covenant Renewal Service that is most often held on New Year's Eve or New Year's Day. The service is known as a watch night service, and it includes readings from scripture and hymn singing. It served as a spiritual alternative to the loud and rambunctious celebrations that most people held to celebrate the coming of the new year. Now, in years past, I remember making New Year's resolutions for myself, like eating better, exercising more, that kind of thing. And I've made some progress, but not nearly what I wanted, I suppose. But that is probably true of most people, I would imagine. We make these resolutions with the best of intentions to make ourselves better, make the world better. And hopefully, even if we are not able to reach the highest marks of those goals, we're at least making things a little bit better along the way. So when looking for things for New Year's resolutions, what inspiration might we find in Scripture? I have chosen four primary resolutions that I believe are worthy of our efforts to follow as best we can. 
Um, and by no means am I saying you must adopt these as your own resolutions, but I ask that you prayerfully consider their importance in how you live your life, not just in the coming year, but throughout your life. Each of these four resolutions will look at a different aspect of faith, life, and the teachings of Jesus and some of the prophets and apostles. This first week, we are going to look at what has been called the greatest commandments. Now, we heard in our second and third readings from the Gospel of Mark and the Gospel of Matthew, respectively, about the greatest commandments. The Gospel of Luke in chapter 10, verses 25 through 28, and in the Gospel of John in chapter 13, verses 31 through 35, they also make reference to the greatest commandments. Given that all four Gospels make reference to these commandments, I think we're pretty safe in saying that they might make good candidates for our first New Year's resolutions. Now, just a quick reminder, these greatest commandments are outlined by Matthew's gospel as you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Matthew then also adds that Jesus said on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. This last line also goes along well with Mark's writing, this is much more important than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. Now Luke doesn't offer the same ending comment that would align with these two, but the dialogue is a bit different, and it's a discussion focused on, the inherent, on inheriting eternal life. But what is interesting is that only John's gospel calls the second commandment to love our neighbor's as ourself, as a new commandment. Mark doesn't make any indication of newness and almost seems to be pointing to this being existing information, as it says, when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, referring to um, the scribe, which indicates the scribe who answered him had read it somewhere, perhaps, or at least had heard it before. Because in Mark, it's not Jesus who offers the answer, but rather it's the scribe. In Matthew, Jesus gives the response of these two commandments, as he does in Luke's gospel as well. So just might where someone else other than Jesus, whom we, we assume would know all the answers, where at least, when it comes to this kind of thing, might someone else have gained this knowledge, the, the answer to this question of the greatest commandment. Well, if you remember our reading from Leviticus, verse 18 says, You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against any of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. So even as far back as the time of Moses, it seems to be understood that we are supposed to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. And ever since then, I would argue that we, as humans, have struggled with doing that. I'm not saying that we haven't done it at all, by no means. Just that because we are human and imperfect, we sometimes stumble in our efforts to love our neighbors. From war to genocide and other atrocities, we sometimes are not able to love our neighbors as ourselves. Even this past year, we saw some harsh examples of when we failed to love our neighbors as ourselves. But we also saw some really great examples of when we loved our neighbors as ourselves. As I mentioned back during Advent and Christmas, we have seen an outpouring of love towards our neighbors through financial support of those who have lost their jobs or seen a significant decrease in their hours and wages. The restaurant industry has been hit incredibly hard, but there have been many people who have stepped up to try and help. We have seen great sacrifice by healthcare workers and retail workers that, to me, are the surest signs of loving your neighbors. Yes, in many cases, their tireless efforts are also driven by the need for income 
to survive themselves, but I still believe it takes a great willingness to do the work and long hours that is at some level also driven by the love of neighbor and love of God. But I also believe there is still more we can do and need to do. I believe we need to continue in our efforts of loving our neighbors. And that may mean different things to many different people. To me, part of it means following the health guidelines from our health department so we do not further spread this COVID-19 virus. To me, it means showing everyone a little bit of extra mercy, patience, and grace. To me, it means listening to others who you may disagree with about things. I'm not saying you should change your views, but we must be willing to listen to one another, to be able to move forward together. Now, more than maybe ever before, we need to cling to the common ground. We can find between ourselves and work towards making things better for everyone. We have, we have too much greed, too much hatred, too much selfishness this last year. As the human race, I believe that we can no longer allow ourselves to traverse down those dark paths and must instead turn back towards the two greatest commandments, to love God and love our neighbors. Those must, absolutely must, be at the core of our daily lives and our mission in the world. In Mark, Jesus said to the scribe who answers him correctly about these two commandments that you are not far from the kingdom of God. What a lovely and beautiful thought. To be near the kingdom of God, is that not something we all want and strive for? To be nearer to God, nearer to paradise, nearer to a reality with, with no suffering or pain. And what I believe that Jesus meant in saying this is that for us, for humanity, to be closer to the kingdom of God, we must follow these commandments. We must work to the absolute best of our abilities to love each other. And believe me, I know that is hard. That can be one of the hardest things for us to do at times. It can be hard in many different ways. How many of you are suffering from cabin fever and need a break from the people that you see every single day, all day, all night? And yet these are the same people that you love more than anything else in this world. How do we love the people who say things that hurt us? How do we love the people who are doing things that seem so hateful and cruel to us? How do we love the people who don't seem to love us back? Can we love them? Is it even possible? Can we really put all the hurt and pain aside and truly, honestly, still love those people? Well, we really want to be closer to the kingdom of God, then we must. We need to find ways to still love each other. That also means we must forgive each other. And we all know how hard forgiving someone can be. Forgiving someone we love, who we trusted, who then betrayed that trust and caused us so much pain and suffering. It often feels impossible. But I assure you, with God, nothing is impossible. With God, we can and we will be able to love each other. From the greatest to the least, however you might understand those terms, 
we were created in love and for love. Despite the awful things that we do sometimes, because we have free will, despite our failings and our fallings, we were made in love. And we are offered salvation because of love. For God so loved the world that he sent his only son that all who believed in him might be saved. I believe that at our very core, the very center of our being, we are made with love and made to love. And I suppose at least for me, I believe that not necessarily because I choose to believe it, but because I can't fathom the alternative. So this year, I am choosing as my first New Year's resolution to love God and love my neighbor. Not that I did not do these things before, but rather I am making a new commitment to do these things. I am going to work harder than I ever have and love God and love my neighbor. Because I believe that we were made in love and to love, I believe that God will walk with me in that journey and help me to achieve that goal. And I believe he will do the same for you if you choose to pursue it yourself. As a fellow child of God, I love you. Amen. If you would please join us in our closing hymn, number 238, Angels We Have Heard on High.
Beloved family of God, be gracious and kind to all with both the gentle acceptance of a child and the wise maturity of a compassionate mother. May the Lord bless you and lay loving hands upon you that you may be strengthened to continue to walk in the faith that others have passed on to you to move ahead into the promised land. Amen. Have a blessed week. Thank you for joining us.